I'll hand over to Martin now. OK, thanks so much, Gerard. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, so Gerard asked me to provide an introduction to Chris, uh, my first time ever. Um, and it does feel exceptionally strange to be doing this uh, from Northern England rather than the familiar surroundings of the Rock Lab. So I've known Chris since the, uh, the mid 1980s uh, when he started his PhD at Newcastle University. And he came to us via um, a BSc in Maths at Durham and an MSc in Medical Stats at uh, Newcastle University. And his PhD was on the spatial analysis and forecasting of crime patterns supervised by Stan Openshaw. And for those of you who've not heard of Stan, uh, he's something of a geographical luminary. Uh, Chris followed this as a research associate in the Centre for Urban and Regional Development Studies at Newcastle, uh, researching amongst other things, spatial temporal variation in property prices in the UK. Uh, while at Newcastle, he worked on a number of other problems, including uh, some notable um, outputs associated with error propagation in GIS. Um, following his period at, in, in Kurds, he worked in the job department for a short time and then the Department of Town and Country Planning. Now, it's very clear from the, the, the outset that Chris's ability to, to bridge the fields of spatial statistics and quantitative geography would lead to something highly innovative. And it was at a meeting, I uh, promise not to mention Beer, but Beer was involved, um, of Chris, uh, Stuart Fothering and myself in the Bridge Hotel in Durham, that Chris produced an A4 sheet bearing the formulae for what then became geographically weighted regression. Papers soon followed, as did software, and at the time, Chris wrote in a language uh, based on um, a very strange language called Lisp. Uh, eventually, there were books, the first on quantitative geography in 2000, then geographically weighted regression in 2002. There were more papers, workshops in the U U USA, Japan and elsewhere. Um, and so Chris followed his time shortly before I left Newcastle um, um, with a chair at the University of Glamorgan. Uh, he then moved back to England for a chair at the University of Leicester and then spent a little time uh, as chair of human geography at Liverpool before joining us about uh, six years ago. So um, he's been prolific, so more books have followed, including uh, one entitled Geocomputation, a primer written with Alex Singleton and notably R for Spatial Analysis and Mapping written with Lex Comber, both appeared in 2015 and the, the R book has just had a second edition. So it's time for me to shut up now and time for what promises to give it a fascinating and insightful, uh, insightful seminar entitled Epidemics Are Geographical, R0 and Reflections. So uh, Chris, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Martin. Uh, okay, so um, first of all, what might be enlightening is to see to what extent I'm able to operate the screen sharing here. So um, one hopes, yeah, if I go on to um, full screen here, so view, um, right, view, slideshow, that's it. Okay, so hopefully um, that's um, now showing you the first slide of the, uh, of the talk. Um, as a, oh, right. So as I say, what I'm basically um, trying to do here is to um, uh, essentially give an overview of uh, generally some of the issues with modelling epidemics. And of course, uh, that's a topic that's been around for quite some time. But at the moment, uh, obviously, it's suddenly become uh, very relevant and uh, you know quite uh, important in terms of, uh, well, A, an area of research and B, uh, just something that affects uh, people's uh, lives generally. So what I'm really going to do then today is to give a bit of an overview of generally how we have to think about modelling uh, epidemics and um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the difficulties with the data we have for that and um, things that uh, you know we, we have to place in terms of that. Um, so that is really going to be fairly focused just generally on the modelling of epidemics. So at that stage it isn't particularly geographical, but then um, I'll try to sort of move things into the geographical framework by saying, well, A, how you can make that model uh, or those sorts of models geographical, and B, you know, basically why I think they should be. And 
those that sort of half, if you like, of the lecture is part from sort of here to here. You can think of as the uh, essentially the you know, more sort of mathematical quant geography bit. But then um, I thought I'd sort of move on then and just generally think about how. It just as a, a geographer, perhaps, uh, you know, some of these issues have, um, uh, you know, made me, me think more broadly about geography. And, you know, OK, I've been largely sort of um, put on, on this particular um, project to, to think about quantitative modelling and things. And that, that's the sort of input that's required of me. But um, also, I think it's, it's uh, you know important to think about um, other issues as well. So I'll talk a little bit about those. And then perhaps uh, I always think particularly with sort of research that um, has been, you know, quite novel and, and also, well, I suppose in this case, stuff I wasn't really even expecting to be doing, uh, you know, three or four months ago, to uh, come up with a few personal uh, reflections on that. So um, that's the sort of overall uh, structure of the talk. Uh, I understand we've got to uh, be done by five, and to be honest, I probably um, haven't had time to put uh, a massively long talk together, so it probably won't be any danger of that, but uh, hopefully there'll be something of interest to people in here. I'm also aware that there's perhaps a mixture of some people who are more from the quantitative and the, the math side and others more from the geography side, so I'll try and uh, sort of strike the balance between the two. So, um, okay, in terms of perhaps striking a balance, then the um, First thing I want to talk about is perhaps a lot more mathematical, but um, since about 1927, people have been looking to find ways of modelling um, epidemics. Um, I'm not sure if this is the case, but it's perhaps not that long after the 1918 uh, epidemic, sort of influenza epidemic, that's um, possibly made this uh, an important uh, topic or a topic that was felt to be um, sort of useful to, to consider. So, um, I'll start off by showing one of the more basic sorts of this models, and this is the so-called SIR model. Um, and essentially what we have here is three sort of um, compartments, if you like, uh, which we call S, I and R. And each of those, um, well, S is the susceptible um, grouping, I is those that are infected, and R is those that are recovered. And essentially what we do is we regard a population as people that are split between these three areas. So um, essentially a certain amount of the population are in the susceptible group at any one time, a certain amount are in the infected group, and a certain amount are in the recovered group. And um, initially, um, most of the population will be in the susceptible group. If you start things off even just with one person in here in the infected group, then what will happen is some people then will be uh, infected or in the susceptible group and move into the uh, into, into the uh, infected group. And then the other thing that happens over time, of course, is that um, hopefully people recover from the infection and move into this group here, the R group, which are essentially people who have recovered and at least uh, initially are considered to be uh, immune from the uh, whichever infection it is, whichever illness it is. It is. Um, and we try to represent these movements mathematically. Um, basically, the rate of change that people move from S to I is dealt with with this formula here. And um, as I've written underneath, this is essentially something to do with interaction between people. It's basically uh, about individuals in the uh, infected group making contact with people in the susceptible group. And so the number of possibilities is basically um, linked to uh, multiplying these two numbers together and then just scaling that by dividing that by the population as a whole. So one way of thinking about that is if a person in the infected group bumps into a random person, the probability of that person being susceptible is S divided by the total population of wherever you're looking at N and then multiplied by some factor which basically measures the degree of uh, infectiousness that the person in the infected group has. And um, initially what we do is, although these are people and therefore really discrete quantities, we just assume it's more like a sort of population flow and these things are sort of fluids. So we use um, differential calculus to say the rates of change here. So really, for those of you not familiar with that, this is just a measure of the rate of change of the infected group uh, with respect to time. So it's as if you like the velocity of growth of the uh, infected group. And the way I like to use these diagrams here, effectively, when I draw one of these equations on top of the arrow here, that's saying that this quantity here 
positively affects this box and negatively affects that box. We're also doing a bit of sort of double entry bookkeeping here that every time someone jumps from S to I, that means that goes up by one, the I group goes up by one and the S group goes down by one. And that's, that's showing how infection builds up. The other side of that uh, process, of course, is the recovery rate. And that's actually um, not so much of an interaction based thing in terms of this, particularly when we don't have any uh, known uh, treatment. So what this is basically giving you is it's telling you that the individual, uh, something that's an individual process rather than um, an interaction between uh, different groups of people, um, is basically the rate, this, this gamma here is the rate at which people recover. And so this is basically saying the flow rate from which the infected people go into the recovered people, or likewise the effect, the rate which the, um, the uh, infected people reduce. And so these are two sort of hypothetical quantities, this rate of infection and the recovery rate. Um, and as I say, in this case, we're assuming that the quantities are continuous and that the values uh, that we're modelling in these are actually the means, the average values of these are changing with time. Um, I won't do too many more of these equations. Uh, you'll see the reason why I put this one in uh, eventually. But uh, what that means is when we've got a diagram like one of these here, we can turn that into a set of equations. And basically, as I said, when you see um, a term on top of one of those arrows, that means it's being subtracted from the, um, the group um, on the, uh, the outgoing part of the arrow and um, added to the group on the ingoing part of the arrow. So that means for the I compartment there, we've got plus this term minus this term for the rate of change of I. Um, so that's put in there. And similarly for R, the recovered rate, that's just the rate of increase there. And for the susceptible rate, that rate there is the rate that people are getting infected. Now, what you will notice there is if you add, <coughs> add those three terms together, then they come to zero. So basically, the total in all of the three boxes doesn't change in this model. So um, you add these three things together, S plus I plus R. If you add the, uh, the differentials together, that equals zero. So the N here is, is a constant. And then finally, for this particular model, this quantity R naught, which is uh, quite often sort of uh, uh, banded about uh, at the moment, um, is effectively the initial um, rate of infection in terms of the number of people uh, an infected person might infect themselves at the start of the uh, uh, of the epidemic. And um, it basically depends on their degree of infectiousness and also the um, the inverse of the recovery rate, because the inverse of the recovery rate effectively is how long they're infectious for. So it's essentially uh, the, the number of people somebody might infect is um, essentially how, how infectious they are uh, times how long they're infectious for. And that, that's essentially what our naught is and more complex models, which I'll come on to do this is more uh, complicated. Uh, this formula will be more complicated, but it's the same general idea. So using R, it's possible to solve differential equations. And um, this is perhaps for some people more of a helpful way to, to look at things. Um, so what I'm doing here is effectively running this model, assuming that the very small number of infected people um, start out at the beginning. The infected people here is this uh, purple line. The um, susceptible population, I've set as round about the population of Ireland, which is just under 5 million. And this is the uh, recovered population. And what you can see, this is um, before you're worried about the huge number of people that are, are going to be um, affected. According to this, at one point, the infected number is going to be about a million a day increasing. This is for a purely, A, with quite a high um, um, infection rate and B, purely unmitigated process. So this, this is the sort of thing that happens if you don't have any lockdown and you try and carry on as normal and you do um, what um, the UK government were initially advocating, possibly a little bit worse than that, but, um, you know, um, sort of the, the, that, that's roughly what you might expect there. And what you can see is that it does peak and then the, um, the level goes down again after a certain while. Um, and this is really because that uh, thing about the rate of infection, um, you'll get to a point where because there's a reasonable number of recovered people, even an infected person is less likely to bump into recovered uh, uh, susceptible people. So that um, 
essentially there's nowhere for the virus to jump to or there's less and less places for the virus to jump to and eventually you reach a point where um there are so few people for the uh, the virus to actually um jump from one person to another to that um, it actually starts dying out more people are immune than would actually be infected as a result and therefore it does die uh, away um and what you can see here is even with a model like this is quite a virulent one at the end of it the recovered people here are essentially people who have um um had the illness uh, and are now uh, recovered and even when that tops out which it will do once there's no more infected people around you'll see that it doesn't actually reach the level of the entire initial population so there's a little bit of a gap there and in one sense, that was the original idea of herd immunity. It basically meant that you will get to a point where even though not the entire population are immune, it does bottom out um, or, or sort of level out. But the problem there is, yes, it does, but only by quite a small amount. So herd immunity isn't a form of protection. It's really just a, a phenomenon. And it's just saying that that number there isn't the entire population. But in unmitigated circumstances, it can quite often be quite near it. So that's... Uh, that's a bit of a worrying uh, point. So that's that's one model. I could rerun the model, but change the beta. So the recovery time doesn't change. You know, that's just the nature of the illness. And at the moment, there isn't a way of treating it. But you have um, a lower infection rate. Now, that's basically because infection rate is to do with interactions between people. And you can actually um, essentially um, make the... Um, uh, you, you, by enforcing some sort of lockdown or by just regulating the way people move and so on or just advocate people do certain things you'll make that rate lower if you do that a number of things happen um, well first off you can see um, that the, um, the curve has sort of shifted along a bit again don't take too much notice of the data this is purely a hypothetical thing um, uh, also you'll see that the number of total number of people infected when it does level off is actually a lot lower so in fact if you're thinking about this thing as being some sort of idea of herd immunity, it does actually um, become more effective if you have, if you, you know, if you restrict the degree to which the infection spreads. Um, obviously, all the social distancing restrictions on travel are essentially trying to, to do exactly that. And the other thing to note, I didn't mention what that um, red line was there, but this is the thing that you've seen a lot of times before. This is essentially a, a hypothetical figure here, but this is the level at which the, uh, the health service of any country or the medical resources of any country can um, deal with the, um, the, this number of cases. And the point being, if you um, apply uh, some sort of uh, lockdown, not only does this curve shift along in time, but it doesn't get as high. Um, the, the aim is to try to get it below where that, uh, that red line is. Uh, if it doesn't, then you have problems. Um, now, of course, what a lot of countries do in response to that is things like the you know building these extra units or slightly repurposing um some some wards of hospital and so forth but those are quite resource intense so even though it enables you to shift that line up a little bit that's not the easiest thing in the world to do and probably uh, uh you know it, it's, it's quite important to try to make sure that you let this peak go down and not only that of course but uh i, I use the term recovered here but a certain proportion of these people are going to die and you know what you're hoping is that that would be resulting in more deaths than, than that does. So really then, um, if we assume at the moment that we haven't got an, a way to change the run of the disease, the course of the, of the illness, whatever that illness might be, um, then um, we can think about changing that term beta. Um, and as I say, when you change beta, and particularly if you reduce it, reduce the infectivity uh, by movement restrictions and so forth, um, you'll notice a number of things happen. First of all, as I say, the peak time of I changes. It, it, you know, it moves on a bit. The peak level of I, the infection count, daily infection count changes. And if you like, R infinity, which isn't the same as the R naught thing, this is the total number of people infected also changes, and that goes down. And what's quite interesting in this case, it is perhaps one of those um, few things where you, you hear this sort of uh, phrase flattening the curve. And actually, um, it does relate literally to a curve flattening, unlike something like a steep learning curve, which um, when you think about it is the wrong way around. If a learning curve is steep, that would mean you'd learn stuff quickly if, if it's sort of knowledge against time. Uh, in this case, it really is a curve that you're flattening. But when people talk about the curve flattening, it's a curve that's the solution of that, uh, that equation, the I uh, 
in, in fact, the equation in there. Um, you can also try to make this statistic a bit more realistic. So um, one of the uh, things that does come out is sometimes this idea of the, um, the exposed uh, compartment in this model as well as the, uh, the infected one. And what that sort of does is it says, well, there's a phrase before full on infection where someone's exposed to the virus um, may actually have taken on the virus, have some degree of viral exposure, but aren't showing any symptoms. Now, the other problem with that is, although they're showing those symptoms, that doesn't mean they're not also infecting other people. So effectively, the susceptibles here are being um, infected by both the uh, I and the E groups in this. Um, the E group moves on to the I group at some point. Some cases where they get a fully blown um, sort of infectious, uh, sorry, symptomatic version of the infection and then move on to recover. The E phase, um, basically, some cases they never actually go to the, um, the infected with symptoms, even though they might have passed it on to others. And that's the asymptomatic thing that people talk about. And here, we just make the model slightly more complicated by saying there's PI, which is the probability or the proportion of the people that become exposed that get a systematic, a symptomatic infection and the uh, proportion that don't. And again, we can set this up in a model like this. Um, I won't go through setting up all of the uh, equations again, but you can again translate these into a system of differential equations. You can solve those in R and you can um, look at the, uh, the curves. I haven't done in this case. What effectively happens is that if I, in an ideal world, res uh, relates to the numbers of notifications that you're getting of the illness, um, doesn't exactly, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but if it does, then essentially um, what that means is that um, more people will actually be um, uh, affecting the susceptible population than are appearing in this count. And this count tends not to be noted unless you increase the, uh, the levels of testing to the extent that you're actually picking up some of the people who are exposed rather than um, infected. And then we've got a few extra parameters in here. We've got basically what I call a rate of uh, transition as well, which is the rate for those um, in the E group that move on to the I group, ha um, how rapidly they're, they're doing that. But again, the, the main interaction term here is this quantity plus this quantity interacting with the susceptible population. Um, so um, that's essentially uh, uh, one way to make the model more realistic and to relate to the particularly to the COVID-19 situation. Um, another thing you can do is um, actually allow for the fact that people can be um, infected more than once. So this is uh, an SIRS model. Um, basically, it's the same as the SIR one, except it's got this back loop. So after a while, people who've recovered become susceptible again and go back into the susceptible group. So the, the whole um, system sort of oscillates to, to some extent. And um, whereas Sometimes you see people discussing on the news and saying, oh, well, can, can people get it again or not? That's a slightly binary view of things where really it's more like, um, OK, you, you build up antibodies if you recover from the illness. But, um, you know, to what extent or how long are those antibodies offering effective protection? So uh, it might be that um, if you have um, if you have the illness, then, you know, you're safe, uh, you know, on average six months or it might be a year or it might be three weeks you know that that's one of the things that has to be um looked at and probably is still being you know investigated at the moment to be honest but a it's a probability distribution and uh, yeah b you know we're, to be honest at this stage we don't really know what the the rate is and here we just got this other parameter here for this backward loop which basically is to say how rapidly people uh, become susceptible again assuming they do so that's um Another model, and you can also add to that by um, putting um, an E box into there as well, so an exposed box. So you can combine all these ideas as well. And in practice, what you do, these are sort of the building blocks. You quite often end up with models like this that are a lot more uh, complex. Um, the one, for example, in Imperial College is, is, is actually more complex even than, than this one. Um, what this one is doing, it's actually got two phases here for the uh, exposed. One is kind of... Um, exposed but um, not infectious then uh, there's a, this one's kind of latent so you you, you are um, infectious but asymptomatic and then it moves on to one of these different phases of severity and of course what they've done here 
which the simpler models don't do, is they're talking about whether you end up in hospital, whether you end up in ICU, and in each of those cases, whether you recover or you die. And, you know, I've been fairly euphemistic before about the R um, phase and the uh, people recovering. And, of course, um, not everyone does. That's, uh, that's a clear uh, fact. Um, so, and, and again, you, you can, even just looking at this, you can see how you could add to it. For example, it's assuming here that nobody that doesn't end up in hospital or ICU dies, whereas that's quite clearly not the case. And the recovered, there could be a, a, a loop back to the susceptible again as well. So you can make these um, models quite uh, complicated um, and, uh, and basically look at the sort of curves I was doing earlier and try to you know, find out things about these. Um, the other point is, up until now, these models have all been just looking at average values, but you could simulate them much more um, in random ways. So you could use um, random variables and integer counts of the S, I and R or the other compartments rather than just the mean value. So one way you can do that is to assume that the changes in the S or the um, I compartments here are binomially distributed um, with the um, number of trials basically being the total uh, number in the group and then applying those changes. So this is, if you like, one particular day, then on day uh, D plus one, these changes are actually made. And it's essentially the same as a differential equation, except now these are random discrete quantities on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and it's quite easy to sort of adapt the uh, ordinary differential equation models that I showed you earlier to uh, use this sort of approach instead. The advantage you get is you can get some idea of the variability of the, the things like the peaks and the maximum values and so forth. Um, and also, if you've got real data, you can use things like um, STAN to actually calibrate um, Bayesian models once you're given the, 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 the notification data. Although, again, I'll talk about the complications of that later on. So looking at my random model, this is just the sort of thing you can then do with that. So this is me running um, the uh, daily rates on the random model. I think it was the the, um, the second one of the ones I showed there um, and um, ran that lots and lots of times. I think about 500. And um, what you can see there is, if you like, here is about the modal time when the peak occurs. And um, you can also see there is a slight variation in the level of the peak, but not that uh, much. But there's a bit of an upper tail on when the peak might occur. It could occur a lot um, higher, um, uh, sorry, a lot further along with quite a small uh, probability, whereas it's less likely to have a lower tail. So it seems to have a sort of a, a longer upper tail and when you might expect it to peak uh, if you look at that model, which is basically a randomised SIR model. But again, you can randomise all of these things. So. OK, so I've been going on quite a long while just giving you an overview of the issues of modelling epidemics uh, and how you go about them. Um, but um, how do we make things more geographical or more spatial? Well, the problem with the above model is it assumed that the well, one problem anyway, is that it assumed that transmission rates uh, were the same absolutely everywhere. So it didn't matter where you were located. It just talked about a population and the probability of two people out of the population interacting, one being a uh, an infected one being a susceptible, and then, you know, the, the, the likelihood of infection would just be the same everywhere. And that's generally not true. So, um, you know, if you live in a, a highly um, densely populated area, then, you know, it's going to be a lot harder, even under sort of measures of social distancing, not to bump into people. If you live in a, you know, sort of, a, a, you know, a remote cottage in the middle of nowhere, it's going to be pretty easy to uh, avoid uh, contact. Um, it's also um, quite clearly, um, not true depending on what uh, you know what kind of job you have if you live in a, if you work in an essential profession then it's going to be a lot harder for you to uh, avoid contact than not and there will be again some sort of geography of, of that as well so basically the idea is that uh, rather than just applying one model for the entire country or you know or, or a larger group of people uh, you'd want to split it into um, smaller groups um, and as I say um, the other thing that matters that's very geographical here is is movement. So again, that can link to so what job you have and again, where you live and where you have to go and so forth. And if you still have to go, there is your job an essential one you've got to travel to. Um, population density is a, a big part of it. So can these models be made more geographically realistic is then the, the, uh, the next uh, question. Well, 
One way you can do that is just to start off with um, the idea of a geographical SIR model. And what we do here is, OK, it looks again very mathematical, so I apologise to the, uh, those that are more uh, geographically oriented here. But um, basically what we've got here is for a set of regions, we've got a, a susceptible count for each of those regions. We've also got uh, an infected count for each region and a recovered count for each region. And the main difference here is this term. And what this is doing is it's basically saying that um, for a particular region, say region I, then people could get infected there either from other people living in region I or from um, sorry, susceptible people in region I could get infected by infectious people in region I, but also by infectious people in other regions as well. So what this thing here is doing is adding up the possibilities of getting infected in a given region by uh, infected people in that region itself and in all of the other regions. And then the um, infectivity sort of parameter thing is no longer just a single value. It's a value for the inter-infectivity -inf between region I and region J. So essentially it's now a matrix. So really what's happening is these S, I and R are now vectors and the B is a, a matrix. The recovery, um, because it's not about interaction so much, you can get away usually with just a, a single parameter here, assuming that healthcare is, uh, you know, or, or treatments are available equally. Now, um, there could well be health inequalities and why we might want to look into that in the future. But at the moment, since recovery is essentially um, a natural thing, I'm, I'm not doing this here, although I certainly fully acknowledge that you could uh, allow for that. So that's the main difference there. Um, so this matrix really, for example, um, is a measure of the, the level of interactivity between different regions. And let's say we're working with counties to start off with. Um, you probably needed to reflect mobility and possibly also um, um, population, uh, population density in, in regions as well. Um, there's a number of ways, number of factors you could calibrate this in your model. One would be a straightforward distance or something like a road distance. Um, it could also be um, a travel to work matrix. Um, it could be um, more detailed um, information about uh, pe people's movement that empirically does pick up on that. There are other possibilities as well. And the other point is you'll probably want to change that at certain times in the model, because if you, for example, apply a lockdown, like at the moment where you're not supposed to go more than two kilometres away from your house in many cases, then you'd expect actually a lot of the interaction, uh, the spread interaction, uh, infection interaction is going to be along this sort of leading diagonal because it will be from people in one county to other people in the same county, at least most of the time. And this matrix here then is reflecting that. So you can run that. This is a little uh, version of it where I um, basically um, seeded uh, an epidemic in Dublin and these are the different rates for each of the different uh, counties. You can see Dublin um, went up here and what I did here was fairly uh, crude, it was just sort of distance based thing. So it basically said that, you know, um, people in Dublin, uh, that the interaction between other people in Dublin was greatest because that, that had the, the smallest distance and then for other counties it will be the distance between that and Dublin and similarly for interaction between all the other pairs of counties and when you run a simulation like that this is the sort of output you get and you can also look at the uh that on a, on a map so these are basically taking different points in time in fact what happened is quite interesting if you look here although dublin got the highest value it didn't peak first in this case um and so actually what's sort of happening there are some places that had a higher concentration than dublin initially but because of the higher population density uh, and higher general population of Dublin, it did actually, it's still one of the highest towards the uh, later points of this uh, particular model uh, epidemic. So what other things might we need to think about there? Well, obviously that B matrix, there's a lot of work to be done to make that realistic. And that's something that frankly, people are still um, thinking about. Uh, and as I say, for the model to be sensible and the simulations to be sensible, that needs to change over time to reflect things like lockdowns, um, various hypothesized gradual relaxations and to see what effects they might have and so forth. Secondly, we probably want to re-implement that as a stochastic model, so as a, a probability-based uh, model. 
Uh, and the other approach that could be done is uh, an agent-based model, um, where effectively what you do is you simulate a population of people rather than locations with sort of compartments in them. And these S, E, I and R are attributes of individuals and basically people, individuals transform from one to another. And you basically make the transition, simulate the transitions happening by randomly simulating their movements. So effectively what you're doing is you're pretending you've got a, a sort of virtual, you know, digital twin population of islands and they move about in certain ways and every now and then uh, there'll be a sort of collision between um, an infected uh, and uh, uh, a susceptible person and then that susceptible person moves to infected for a certain time and while they're moving about you'll see you know how that affects others and so forth so it's the same idea uh, a lot more computationally intensive and also you know has to make it, um, assumptions but uh, that's uh, that's an alternative approach that can can be used um, but a big problem you're going to get in Ireland is what about the north because at the moment even if we get data for um, uh, places in the Republic, um, you know, we, we have to also allow for the fact that uh, north of the border, they'll be doing different policies, possibly different patterns of movement and so forth. So that's going to be, you know, something that really, you know, we, we are looking at that so quite so seriously, obviously. Um, so a few further issues. Um, what data can you work with? Um, well, you can use the daily notifications that are published, but there are issues with that. Um, one of them is that there's a time lag because essentially what happens is someone is swabbed. At some point later, the result of the test comes back telling you if they're positive or not. So there's actually a time lag, uh, usually a few days between the, um, the, the, the swabbing and the, or the whatever kind of test is used and the, um, the result coming back. And the other complication is that that actually changes with workload. If there's, a, you know, in the early days of the uh, of the outbreak, you get things back quite quickly because there weren't many tests going on. Later on, the workload got a lot heavier. And in fact, to the extent that uh, a number of um, tests, actually a number of swabs actually had to be sent to, to Germany to be tested and they took even longer to come back. But that was actually rather than a gradual uh, stretching of the time lag, it suddenly went up in a sort of quantum leap because of that. Uh, the other point is, you know, changing uh, policy and testing. So who's uh, who's who's uh, you know entitled to take a test and so forth. And when you test more, you will get more positive results. So that's a, that's another thing. And then there's also, I mean, perhaps this is more to do with the the, the death, but also that does then again backlog into um, you know actually uh, testing, you know, counting the notifications. Um, you know, when does um, a particular uh, um, uh, so when, when does a death actually get uh, classed as uh, being due to COVID-19 or not? And uh, whereas you can be pretty certain someone died or not, cause of death can be uh, a complicated matter sometimes. Um, another thing you can use is the date that the test was done for um, positive outcomes. So instead of actually the date that the notifications occur, you find all the ones that were notified as positive and then use the date that they've been um, tested. Um, that helps for certain things. It overcomes that problem with the, the, the German data. But on the other hand, there are still issues with, um, with definitions there. Um, sometimes hospitalizations are used, not because being hospitalized is contagious, but it's a proxy for infections. And um, because it's, although there are some changes in what was considered a suscept, uh, you know, kind of um, a suitable level of, uh, of severity for hospitalization. Um, it is sort of, um, it's not, a, you know, it, it, it's possibly more stable than using things like the um, the actual um, the test results as, as, a, as a measure. Similarly for death, but as I say, the um, the cause of death is, as I say, subject to sometimes debate and ambiguity, and it just takes a long time to establish. Um, and then the other point is um, all these other parameters sometimes need uh, estimating as well. So the probability of someone being asymptotically infected is currently quite a difficult one to analyse because you need random testing effectively to establish that. So that's pretty much the sort of issues in terms of modelling. There are other geographical issues, as I said, and I'll, I'm looking at the time, so I'll just go over these quite quickly. Um, but I mean, you know, a few other things are just um, actually the sort of social and spatial justice are, that are linked to uh, a lot of these issues. I mean, one idea 
Um, I've been using it as terms of a lockdown justice. Um, not everyone has the same access to green space when they're, um, you know, uh, locked down. And, you know, some people live in a, an apartment without even a balcony or without any access to anything. Uh, others have got um, plenty of space. And, you know, that, that's going to have a different effect on people, possibly on other effects of their health, uh, as well as the COVID-19 thing. And of course, there's also a, a number of sort of social gradients here. So there are, um, you know, kind of, um, um, you know, differing risks across the population. Um, there's been uh, different sectors of the population seem to be at greater risk quite often due to the jobs they're doing and so forth. And that, that's been noted in the US and in the in the UK. So, um, you know, these are things that perhaps, uh, you know, need to be, be looked at as well. And, you know, um, things like contact apps as well and apps that trace people's movement. I know Rob has um, raised an issue about the, the sort of privacy issues there, and I would um, totally uh, agree with that. Uh, so although, um, you, you know, um, it's certainly been talked about, you know, I would certainly be another one who has uh, concerns about that possibly, even if they might be useful now, it's what might happen subsequently. Um, and then just a few final personal reflections. I suppose this is about me having to do very different research than what I had been doing um, um, due to a you know, very sudden change in circumstances. Um, so it's a bit about me sort of having to, if you like, dust off techniques that I've not used in a while. So, you know, there were tools that um, I did possess, but some of them are lurking in the back of the garden shed, if I'm honest. It's a while since I've had to solve um, differential equations numerically, given that the stuff I normally do, but had to sort of rethink about those skills and think about how those ideas now link to much newer ideas that um, I, um, you know, have learned since the last time I did things with differential equations, but how they might be appropriate here. So it's led me to sort of think a bit about that. Uh, another point is this whole thing that um, this is just the nature of the research here and if you like the nature of the urgency, but um, we're looking at, you know, obviously a lot of research articles about the uh, the viability of the data, the process, the analytical and statistical techniques and so forth. And whereas there's plenty of stuff that has been done in the past, there's a whole wealth of new stuff that's come out very recently. And a lot of that is stuff on archive, archive hasn't yet been refereed. And what we're sort of having to do a lot more is um, realise that this is, you know, quite a lot of the material we're looking at isn't refereed and, and you know, having to sort of internally um, do some sort of, uh, you know, uh, internal refereeing uh, to just decide, you know, how helpful things are. And that, that's perhaps a very different um, means of um, working, especially in the sort of STEM community than perhaps is, is normal. And then I'll just finish off with my usual thing that I like to talk about. And I think it's important here particularly is reproducibility and openness regarding data and software is actually, I've said here, it's important. I would actually argue it, it is uh, essential. So, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, also going back to the point about the, you know, the privacy issues and things like that, I think it's pretty um, important to know exactly what is being done with this data, how it's being processed. And that would uh, certainly re re require openness and reproducibility and the, the point that the, the source code of any uh, software is being shared and that's that's the negative side the positive side of that is also um in dealing with something like this it's very important to be able to share information with uh, other countries that are working on this and with other researchers and making sure that the um the, the the techniques and the information are um shareable with the minimum of friction is going to be very helpful here so that thing also becomes uh, important so um, I'll leave things there. I'll press the escape key and see, hopefully, um, if I can now um, get back onto the real world again. That's great. Thanks a million. And uh, Alistair had a good suggestion there. Does everybody want to unmute for a second? I assume that is Alistair <laughs> clapping. Um, does anybody want to unmute for a second? Thank you. That's great. Thanks a million, Chris, um, for a fascinating talk. So we've had a couple of questions already um, in the chat. Uh, so Ronan Foley was the first one to ask a question. Ronan, would you like to ask Chris your question directly? Yeah, I will, yeah. <clears throat> Just a question about scale, Chris. You know, you, you have a county by county matrix, and I assume that if you start going down to like ED level or a small area, you're going to get, you're going to get it just gets far too complicated. But is there a sort of a 
I suppose, a cut-off number of units, if you like, in terms of the number of areas, you know, maybe a, you know, a, a primary care and a district network or something like that, 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 that um, you can't model below, if you like. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the answer is, yes, there is. And we kind of know this because we know when we're above it and we know where we're below it, but we're not always sure when we're at it yet. And of course, the other point is that, you know, the data is only available as a set of, um, yeah. you know, kind of uh, fixed units. I mean, I think county, to be honest, for this kind of modelling is about the lowest we can get to because you need um, reasonably large numbers to get you know, to as estimate those um, th those parameters reliably and um, particularly the interaction stuff uh, because you know actually that's you know there's 26 squared numbers in that and you know we, we're using various ways to try to simplify that but um, you, you know if, you, if you're trying to calibrate that with you know say all of the uh, small areas you've then got 18,000 squared different yeah. parameters yeah. to uh, identify so um, yes you're right that there is there's another thing we're looking at, which is more like a kind of um, um, cluster detector uh, sort of approach, which is more like straightforward statistical analysis, not really epidemic modeling. That is working to much smaller levels. Um, you know, that, that's a bit like um, scan statistics, if you come across those before. Um, but even then, you know, we're also trying to do things like, you know, correct for age and things like that in there as well, an age structure. And um, what we're finding is that, you know, if you say, put the thing into, you know, four age groups and say 26 counties, then that's um, whatever, 104 category, you know, that, that's 104 squared interactions. And uh, so you, you do, it's usually just about, you know, stopping the parameters exploding. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Super, thank you. Um, so just to remind for anybody who did arrive late to, if you have, do have a question, please just indicate that you want to ask a question in the chat and I'll come around to you. And I will come around in order, it'll just be easier for me. So the next one I have on my list is uh, Ona Mahoney. Uh, hi, Chris. Thanks for your time. Hi. Interesting. Um, so how might this feed into a set of decisions where we have the possibility of some areas being eased in restrictions over others? Um, that's, a, that's an interesting point. I mean, at the moment, I don't think that's one that's being considered that much, but um, it's, I mean, in terms of the modeling, that would be relatively easy to do because you've got this sort of um, interaction matrix and you, you can look at the effects of, uh, you know, cutting down the interactions between mm -hmm. certain areas that you want to um, essentially, you know, try to, uh, you know, can maintain a lockdown in, whereas others you don't. Um, I think there's a lot of practical problems with it because what that essentially means is that, OK, you apply those rules, but if you've not applied them to other areas, yeah. You're almost going to have to sort of, uh, you know, have like a have a mini border around the areas you're putting the lockdown in. Otherwise, yeah. you know, other people are going to go into them. So I, I can see a lot. I can see how you can model it, but I, I don't know how easy. Well, you know, I don't know how easy it is to actually implement a policy like that. I mean, I think, okay. um, yeah, mm -hmm. that, yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating the ge geographical differences in in where the the cases are and where the the, the deaths are occurring per head of population. Um, yeah. So next up, I have Jerry asking a question. Uh, hi, Chris. Um, hi. I, I was just looking at the um, the data this morning on the the rates per million, the mortality rates per million, and the, <laughs> the top nine countries are European. Um, you know, way ahead of China and all the rest of it. And it made me wonder whether whether or not the susceptibility of countries is to do with the the original openness of the of the so so that the really important thing to model was the thing that happened before we started to actually get any cases and deaths. You know, um, you know how many weeks of 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 seeding of Ireland was there, and can we model the geography of that seeding more uh, realistically than just saying it was doubling? You know, is there any way of model and 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 what effect upon the models would a geography of seeding be, or does the model converge very quickly, regardless of of, of what the original seeding is? It, it's a good point. I mean, uh, I think you know one of the things just playing around with the model that you could do to to invest that, as, as you say, it's quite possible that the uh, you know the seed didn't come from Dublin. Like, that was just a simulation I ran, but you can run it from you know the you know simulation starting in lots of other places. What tends to happen is because in a lot of you know in a lot of the models, once something gets into a place with a high population density, it spreads much faster. So again, just because this you know chances of interaction are loads higher in urban areas than um, in rural areas. So what 
would probably happen is that, uh, in fact, on some simulations I have run, which unfortunately I didn't show today, uh, is that um, the growth will be initially slow if it's in a you know less populous area. But then once you get one person into, say, Dublin or somewhere else with a very high population density, Dublin being the, the, obviously the, the, you know, the most extreme case of that, it will um, start to ramp up pretty quickly. So what you'll get is probably a low peak earlier on in the less dense place. But then once it hits Dublin, it will still go up quite a lot. So if you like, one, once one case is in there and seeded it there, it'll do pretty much what it's done before. But, um, you know, some other places, if that happens that way, may have, um, you know, already sort of peaked quite a lot. But the other complication you'll get with that is, um, you know, once um, something does start peaking somewhere like uh, Dublin, is you, you can always get a, a, a sort of backflow effect to the original place, because although, you know, low population density might mean it had a, you know, very flat um, epidemic initially, some something hits Dublin and then someone from Dublin goes there or someone from Dublin goes to somewhere else and that other person goes back in there and you know you can get a sort of and if again if there's a very high number of people in Dublin then the outspread could be quite um quite wide so you can almost get sometimes a little bit of a a, a back kick effect now I don't know if that answers your original question about you know initial behavior and how that affects things um probably doesn't but um what sort of happens is I think that the seeding kind of um what it probably tends to do is, it, I don't know, it's a bit like saying if you've got um, a pile of gunpowder in the middle of the room, if you chuck a batch straight into the gunpowder, you know, the, that'll blow the room up. If you light the room somewhere else, the fire will spread slowly to there, but then it'll hit the gunpowder at some point eventually anyway, and then explode, probably setting fire again to some bits of the room that might have already uh, gone out. So um, that probably would happen there. In terms of, yeah, just, you know, different levels of preparedness, that, that's going to make a big difference, I think. And... You also mentioned per head of population as a measure. I, I sometimes wonder for once whether that's actually the most useful measure because um, it's actually a little bit about the variations in the population density that um, affect you know how, how badly you might expect somewhere to um, to be affected. So somewhere that's um, you know got quite a large area but all its population concentrated in one small part is probably going to get a much heavier hit in terms of um, per head of population. So not that I think that that's any excuse for the way uh, I know Britain looks like it's well in the, uh, if not in the lead, probably quite likely to, you know, be very high in terms of this. I don't think it's much of an excuse for that, but I think, um, you know, the, the actual, um, if you like, the yardstick isn't necessarily total population over total area. It might be something like maximum population density or, or something like that to, to measure as a, as a sort of a yardstick just to allow for that. Great. Thanks a million. Uh, next on my list, I have a question from Mary. Thanks, Chris. Um, just wondering, what's the level of data sharing and collaboration with authorities in Northern Ireland? And what are the implications of that level for the work that you're doing? Um, at the moment, actually, it's quite good. There are people on the modelling team, which I'm on, who are talking to, you know, sort of counterparts in the north so that they are now actually um, be, well, you know, they are being pretty good about that. And, you know, it's, it's a cooperative thing. It matters a lot, though, in, in terms of the actual process, because, as I said, um, you know, all of these models, if we just assume that we're looking at the um, connections between you know, counties or whatever uh, regions in the, in the Republic, of course, what's happening is that uh, many of those will uh, border onto uh, you know, counties in the north. And uh, then we don't know quite so much about what's happening there. At the moment, that's improving. One of the big issues is as the official count data sometimes isn't the most useful because, you know, of the, the process underlying it. Not, I don't think there's any uh, intention to mislead, but it's just, it's just difficult. And um, what's happening, I think, now is people are actually beginning to share, you know, some of the more, um, um, if you like, nuanced data, which is sometimes necessary so you don't get caught up in, in that. So... Um, yeah, we, we are sharing. And I mean, in fact, generally across countries broadly, there is um, a good uh, you know, tendency to share. And as I say, I think especially in the academic community, there, there has been quite a big well, academic statistical community, a big move towards the sort of reproducibility and open source and open data and so forth, which has been very, uh, very helpful in that. And, um, you know, that, that's also been helpful in just us being able to use sort of Canadian models, um, French models uh, and so forth to look at our own data. But again, because they actually share the code, 
Um, this is another geographical point, but you know, no two countries really are the same, and uh, we nearly always have to modify the code. But the fact that it's open source, we can see what they're doing, we can see what things they're modeling, and we can then think about how that might be different in Ireland than it would be in the country that it came from, and we can adapt it. And some of what we've done has been writing our own new code uh, on the basis of thinking about what, what is happening here, but other has been taking on board useful ideas from other people that um, are good grounding, but uh, possibly require a little bit of uh, modification to fit uh, the, uh, the Irish situation rather than the, the ones that they came from. Okay, thanks a million. Um, okay, so I have a question myself actually, and it, it's kind of a little bit linked to some of the issues you've touched on, um, particularly in answering Jerry's question, but I, I'm very interested in the, I suppose, the, the high incidence in Cavan and Monaghan in particular. Um, where you don't have a very high population density, which I guess you touched on. But you, I, I guess I'm wondering, I'm getting your opinion on whether it is a population related issue in those counties or a proximity to Northern Ireland relation issue, or where would you, where would you feel is the, the origin of those kind of counties being particularly badly affected? So it's a very good point. I mean, well, there's two things there. I mean, what, it, to be honest, it's, it's just something that we're actually trying to work out, you know, right now. I mean, the, the, there's, but the, there's, you know, it's almost sort of equifinality of the two things. You know, it could be that uh, it's because of, you know, bordering effects from, from the north. Um, the other um, thing that, because they are quite low um, populations, one of the things that does just generally happen, rather boring statistical fact, but because um, when you work out rates of things, the things that are based on a smaller sample and with a smaller, um, uh, you know, denominator on the fraction actually have more variance. So it's not uncommon for um, smaller samples when you rank things in terms of rates and percentages to end up near either the top or the bottom because of the greater variance. Now, that said, yes, it, it's, it's a bit interesting that they're all geographically in that location and that they're all at the top. Um, so the answer is, it's something that's been noted. That, yeah, you, you, you know, we've noticed it as well. Um, and it's something I wouldn't, um, you, you know, I, I, I wouldn't uh, dismiss that as a, as a possibility. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. That, that's, that's kind of what I'd be saying at the moment. And I think modern people would probably complain about not having a hospital as well. That seems to be good. Well, that, yeah, I mean, this, this could be part of it as well. Yes. I mean, you know, the, the access to, to treatment. So the outcomes are different because if we're talking particularly about deaths, then you get a big, you know, because fortunately they're, they're relatively low occurrence, so you do get more variability on that. But yes, I mean, that, that is the other point, and perhaps going back to some of the things like sort of social justice or things, you know, access to healthcare, and, uh, you know, okay, there aren't treatments as such, you can't give people a pill to make it go away, but on the other hand, access to ventilators quickly and things like that do affect the outcome. Thank you. Uh, Rob, you have a question. Yeah, Chris, I just wanted to come back to your reproducibility uh, uh, question and whether there's any indication that the data and the models that you're using will be released. And at the minute, we kind of have the headline figures, but we don't No, Nobody would be able to replicate what the modeling team is doing at the minute because we don't have sufficient uh, access. So so while you're talking about there is sharing a code and data between teams, it's very much if you're inside the tent. You know, if mm. you're part of a national modelling team, then there's there's sharing going on. But if you're outside of that community, then uh, you don't. Yeah. I guess yeah. the danger, of course, is you don't want a lot of amateurs and you don't want a lot of noise and, um, you know, so on. But at the same time, there is a notion of there being some level of transparency beyond just headline numbers. No, I, 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 would, I would agree with that. I mean, I think, um, as you say, there are certain issues with just, you know, letting everything go, you know, completely uh, wild. But on the other hand, I think of late, if you look at some of the stuff that's released, you know, they are increasing what they're doing. And there, there are certainly, um, you know, the voices that are wanting to uh, to share more things, especially when, um, if you like, the, um, you, you know, if you do just work at the headline figures, that you know, that they really... Um, aren't sufficient to give you that reliable uh, a model. Um, so, yeah, I think that, you know, that there, there is, um, you know, again, you know, internally without saying too much, you know, that there are calls for that. I mean, to some extent, it's just that half the time what we're doing is uh, trying to negotiate, you know, what we are allowed to uh, to get a hold of even now. And that, you know, that, those are internal pressures. I mean, my, you know, myself and a number of others do 
place for the openness but you know uh, uh, broadly you know, not everyone does at the moment that that's a problem but um i mean i guess what I'm kind of hoping will happen is that uh, even if we're not getting them while the thing is ongoing, you know, later on down the line, that the, you know, historical data, you know, when we say historical, not that historical, but a few months old would be released. So it would then be possible after the, uh, you know, time if there, if there were sensitivity issues at the time that it could be released. But um, I suppose also the point is that, yeah, I agree, you know, that should be, you know, just out in the world ultimately. Um, the the other point is even if we're just internally um, working on reproducibility, um, uh, even that's important. I would also say you know I've seen situations where that's not been the case, and uh, you know that that can be um, disastrous. So you know even though people are supposedly working in in a team to try and solve the same problem, you'll get um, stuff passed around that isn't quite what it was supposed to be, and nobody knows how the program works and things like that. And that actually leads to you know virtually no progress. So I, I think. Point number one is yes, you know it, it's important anyway internally, but the yeah in the longer term I think it should be uh, you know made uh, made available. But yeah, of course there, there's negotiations going on about that. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't have any more questions queued up on my chat. Does anybody have any final questions for Chris? If not, then well, thank you again, Chris. Um, it was a super a f fascinating talk and uh, exceptionally topical at the moment. And um, thanks for doing it for us uh, when you're so busy with um, very pressing matters as well. So we appreciate that. Um, I'll remind everybody as well that we have the last seminar of the series. The reactions that's one one bit of the technology that definitely hasn't been solved the kind of uh <laughs> reactions it's that's somebody running about it's quite strange really but uh, sorry that's ungrateful thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> um well i think we need i need a recording here that should be part of the host option or something like that rapturous applause or something like oh, that. canned laughter and canned applause yes that's uh, yeah uh, absolutely uh, so I remind everybody else that we have the, the last seminar uh, of the, the the semester next week uh, same time same place uh, we're going to have a selection of uh, staff who were funded under the Research Incentivization Fund last year tell us about their research. That's uh, Alistair, Karen, Helen and Ro will be talking to us. So um, I hope to see you all there. Uh, thanks again, Chris, and thanks to everybody for turning up. And um, thanks for making this a memorable geography seminar. Take care.